Well, hey there, and welcome to Unit 2, Biological Basis of Behavior in AP Psychology. I'm so glad that you've joined me. Please make sure that you check out in the link below this video where you're watching my Teachers Pay Teachers store where you can find all of the notes, really for the entire AP Psychology course, but particularly this set of notes on the neuron and the whole unit of biological basis so that you can kind of follow along and it takes you lockstep right through what we need, including all kinds of diagrams for this unit. So make sure you've got those and let's go ahead and get started. So your learning targets for this one are duh, all about the neuron, right? But it's not just understanding the parts of the neuron, it's understanding how the neurons talk to each other, which is the neural firing process. So let's go ahead and get right into it. So first you have to understand the parts of a neuron. Really, first you have to know what the heck a neuron is. It's just a nerve. A neuron is a nerve, that's all it is. It's a nerve that is in your brain, and the networks that allow you to think um, and as well as throughout your body. And that's pretty much it. So let's go through the parts of the neuron. The first one is those dendrites. And what I'm actually gonna do is show you the neuron dance. And I want you to be able to do this yourself physically. So what you do is you take your left hand and you kind of bring it as close to your body like this as possible, almost as if your hand is like attached to your body. Okay, and then you put your right arm out as long as you can and kind of do your jazz fingers over there as well. Okay, so these are your dendrites and dendrites receive incoming messages from other neurons. They send that message to the soma or cell body, which contains your nucleus. Like, let's say your nucleus is like your heart. You always make decisions with your heart, let's say. So that nucleus is what makes decisions. It decides whether or not to fire the message along the longest part of the neuron, which is your right arm, is the axon. The axon being the longest part of the neuron, um, which the electrical message travels the length of. Now there's kind of some parts on the axon that are really important. Imagine that you had like sweatbands. Let's say it's 1992 again, if you have sweatbands going down your arm, right? These are called myelin sheath. These look like the little sausage links on your screen. They are fatty tissue that insulate, which means keep warm, the axon speeding up transmis transmission of the message. So myelin sheath is fat and it speeds up the message. Now the points in between your sweatbands or in between the myelin sheath are called the nodes of Ranvier, just named after the guy who first found them. And it is simply the space between the myelin so that the message can almost like jump the myelin sheath. Inside of those are called, inside of myelin, I'm sorry, it's called Schwann cells. These are non-neuronal cells in the central nervous system, meaning they are cells, but they aren't neurons that form myelin sheath, okay? So the job of the Schwann cell is to create, to generate myelin. Now, at the end of your extended right arm, you have your jazz hands. These are called the axon terminal buds. Think of them as like your fingernails or maybe your fingertips. This is the end point of a neuron that releases what's called neurotransmitters into the synapse. We're gonna talk about what that is too. Hence, sending the message on to the next neuron. Okay, so an axon terminal buds, the ends of your fingers there, they send the message on to the next neurons, dendrites. Okay, so you've got the parts. I encourage you to practice them often. Um, but now let's talk about the neural firing process, how neurons communicate with each other. Okay, let's say that they aren't communicating with each other at all, meaning one neuron is not being used, which is true. There's a neuron in your brain being not used right now. It is at resting potential. This is when a neuron is not firing. It has a negative charge. And this picture here is like the axon of a neuron. And if you notice, like the tube there, it looks like, is like a giant negative sign. So that's how I help my students understand at resting potential, when it's not firing, it's like a giant negative sign, right? Like the axon, it's a giant negative sign. Um, and it has a negative charge with mostly potassium ions inside and mostly sodium ions on the outside. Okay, potassium being the K on the inside, sodium being the Na on the outside. 
This means that the neuron is what's called polarized. Think of the North and South Pole, right? It's how magnets are able to exist, right? Science people, I'm pretty sure, right? They are pushing away from each other, allowing our globe to be circular, I think. Um, so they are pushing away from each other because opposites don't like each other. And that's the way it is in the neuron as well. Sodium and potassium are away from each other at resting potential. Therefore, the neuron is polarized. Um, again, I'll, I'll say it again, resting potential, it's polarized sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. At this state, the neuron is at what's called homeostasis. Homeostasis being its normal, happy, here's where I want to be state. The state at which it strives to obtain regularly. So whenever it's not polarized, it is striving hard to get back to it. All right, then we have what's called action potential. Action potential is the nerve impulse. It's the electrical pulse or message that travels the length of the axon. So action potential actually only goes down the axon. It's not in the dendrites or the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus decides to fire or not. And when it fires, the action potential goes down the axon. So again, the action potential is the electrical pulse that goes through the axon of the, the neuron. Now, some other kind of key concepts to understand is the all or nothing principle. So when the nucleus decides to fire, it fires down the axon completely or not at all. And it does so at consistent strength as well. So maintaining the same intensity, strength, or power of the message the entire length of the axon. Now, I want to make a toilet analogy for you <laughs> between a neuron and a toilet. So what I would encourage you to do on your notes is based on your knowledge of the neuron thus far, so maybe with a partner or just down on your notes and then talk about it in class tomorrow, how is a neuron similar to a toilet? How is a neuron firing similar to a toilet? something to think about. And I'm about to give you some more information that would apply there. Okay, so let's say that the neuron fires. Action potential starts going down the axon. It depolarizes. Depolarization is when opposites, like sodium and potassium, are no longer away from each other. This happens with action potential like a domino effect down the axon. So sodium actually rushes in. The gates open, these little like squares here, they actually open and sodium rushes in, causing potassium and negative ions to get the heck out. Like, whoa, why are you in here? I can't be around you. And so it rushes out. And that causes then more sodium to go in, potassium to freak out and rush out, and sodium to go in and blah, blah, blah. All right, so depolarization happens all the way down the length of the axon, right? Okay, so it has fired, it's done. Then we have something that's called the refractory period, right? It's totally out of homeostasis right now. Um, it's, it's just not feeling good, the neuron is not. So it's the refractory period, it's what is the period of time after firing that the neuron is focused on resetting and therefore is unable to fire again. So what happens is the sodium starts to leave. So the potassium feels good about going back in. And this happens again as a domino effect all the way down the, the, the axon. So to clarify, sodium goes back out and potassium comes back in. Now reflect in your notes, or it could be with a partner, how is refractory period similar to the process of a toilet flushing? Kind of interesting, kind of funny, right? All right, we've got some really specific stuff to talk about here, and I wanna, it's kind of being repetitive, but I think it's important to say it again. So here we've got our big, huge neuron up top, right? And I'm using this little orange arrow here to say that we're zooming in on the axon. So this, kind of gray cylinder tube looking thing is the axon of the neuron. This little box here is a gate. OK, 
okay? These are gates and that the walls of the axon aren't just permeable. They have little gates that allow potassium and sodium in and out. So here we come with this arrow, arrow, the stimulus arrives and the orange dots are sodium that rush in and depolarize, right? So the sodium channels open and sodium ions rush in. So that then potassium channels open and potassium rushes out, right? The potassium wants to get the heck out of there. The first sodium channels then close. As you see, the stimulus is now going down the axon, right? But channels further down open, causing the process to go the length of the axon. Again, it's like a domino effect. It doesn't all just surge at once. Just like, I don't know, like telephone pole, the electricity wire it doesn't all surge at once. It's really fast, but it goes down the wire. Okay, now we've talked about action potential and what's happening in the axon. Now let's talk about what's happening at the end of a neuron and in between neurons. Okay, the synapse is a really important factor. So what's happening in this image here is this little guy, yellow thing up at the top, is the sending neuron. And action potential has gone down the length of the axon and we are now in the terminal bud of the neuron, right? The axon terminal bud of a neuron. You'll see that neurotransmitters, these little teeny bitty little dots, they are chemical substances that cross the synapse to carry the message to the next neuron. The synapse here, which is simply an open space. So a synapse is really a name for nothing. It's just the open space between two neurons at which neurotransmitters cross. That's it. And then what you see on this receiving neuron down here, so that would be the dendrite of the next neuron, we have these little like grooves, which are receptor sites. They are specific points on the dendrites of a neuron that receive specific types of neurotransmitters. So each neurotransmitter has a specific receptor site on each neuron. So it's important to note that the synapse is simply a gap. It's just an open space between neurons and therefore not a process or a, not a part of the firing process of a neuron. Kind of tricky there. Now, there's different types of neurotransmitters, and this is really important stuff for us to understand, especially as we move forward in the biological bases unit. You've got to know each of these terms. This first one is called acetylcholine. Acetylcholine, its primary role is muscle contraction, so you being able to squint your face or flex your, flex your muscles. It's also involved in memory and learning. Now, there's associated disorders with each of these, and that too little acetylcholine actually is Alzheimer's disease. Then we have dopamine, which is involved in movement and thought processes, but I've bolded one that's really important here. It is our naturally existing rewarding sensation. So every time you eat your favorite meal, every time you score a goal in your game or win a game at family game night, or I don't know, get a yes on the date from the girl you've been asking <laughs> forever, right? You get a rush of dopamine. It's the rewarding sensation you get. If you have too little dopamine, it's Parkinson's disease. If someone has too much dopamine, it's schizophrenia, but there, it's also very much involved in drug addiction, really any kind of addiction. Serotonin, um, its primary roles is emotional states and sleep. And if you have too little serotonin, you're clinically depressed. Norepinephrine is involved in physical arousal. This is actually the technical term for adrenaline, which is a hormone that we'll talk about in our next set of notes. But I mention it here because physical arousal, that makes sense with adrenaline, right? But please note that adrenaline is not a neurotransmitter. It is a hormone. And we'll talk about that later. It's also linked with learning and memory. Um, if you have too little norepinephrine, that's also involved in clinical depression as well as stress. GABA works to inhibit brain activity. And so the idea here is that um, if certain neurons that aren't involved in an action your body wants to do, GABA is released to make sure that those neurons aren't involved because they shouldn't be. 
Um, these are really involved in anxiety disorders. And then we have endorphins. Endorphins are all about pain perception and that it's your naturally existing pain threshold, right? It increases your pain threshold, essentially gives positive emotions and almost like a runner's high. If you've ever heard of that, like when someone is running and really in their groove thing with running and they get like a surge of more energy as if they don't feel their aches and pains, um, that's endorphins. It is very involved in opiate addiction, opiate being opium, um, morphine and harem being derivatives of opium. Okay, so when we talk about neurotransmitters, we've got to talk about outside substances, okay? Outside substances that we might consume or otherwise come into our bodies and have a psychological effect on us are either agonists or antagonists. Now, I want to be clear here. This is something that's really interesting. Anything that you consume that has an impact on you psychologically, so think caffeine, nicotine, as extreme as cocaine, none of them would have an impact on you if there wasn't already something in your brain naturally existing that was just like it. Okay, that's kind of crazy, right? You're going to understand what I mean here in just a little bit. All right, agonists and antagonists are both outside or external substances from your body. They're from the environment that somehow interact with neurotransmitters once they've been consumed at the receptor sites of dendrites of a neuron. Both interact differently at those receptor sites, okay? So I'm going to make what's called a key analogy here. You've got three keys. You've got your real house key that lets you in to your house. You've got like a master key that works for like all of the locks in your house. It's not really your house key, but it'll work. And then you've got number three, a fake or a wrong key that fits in the keyhole, but it doesn't let you in. It doesn't let you get your actual house key in, in order to get into your house. Okay. So we're going to make an analogy with those three types of keys. The first one is an agonist. Okay. An agonist mimics neurotransmitter activity it fits into the receptor site like a master key okay it fits into the receptor site like a master key it works just like the original house key but it is not exactly the same okay so the neurotransmitter the naturally existing neurotransmitter is your house key the agonist is the master key that fits and it works but it's not your house key An antagonist actually blocks neurotransmitter activity. It fits in the receptor site like a fake key fits into your house, like your door lock, preventing the naturally existing neurotransmitter or your house key from getting into the receptor site and doing its job, right? Let's say like the, the fake key gets stuck. Well, now you can't get into your house. That's like what an antagonist is. It blocks the naturally existing neurotransmitter from doing its job. Let's give you some examples. An example of an agonist would be morphine, which is an opiate derivative. It mimics endorphins. Think of the effects of morphine. Okay, you probably know someone who's had surgery um, and been in a lot of pain, let's say. Um, It's used for anesthesia and for pain control, morphine, right? How does that make sense given the role of endorphins? Well, endorphins, think of Legally Blonde if you've ever seen that movie, right? People who exercise have a rush of endorphins. Endorphins make people happy. Happy people don't kill their husbands. (laughs) Well, actually, she is kind of wrong there because it's not just what makes you happy. Yes, it's positive emotions, so that's true, Um, but it's more about pain threshold. So morphine allows you to not feel pain. Well, that's what endorphins do. Antagonists. All right, botulism. Have you ever been told to not buy from the grocery store a can of anything, beans, fruit, whatever, that is dented? 
if you haven't, you shouldn't. You shouldn't buy dented cans. And the reason being, it's probably because the guy at, I don't know, Piggly Wiggly or whatever, dropped the can and it dented and he put it on the on the shelf anyway. But it could mean that botulism is in the can and it acts as a vacuum. Well, if you consume botulism, it paralyzes your digestive tract and kills you. Okay. Well, here's the thing. Botox is a strain of botulism. So Botox injected in your face or wherever, making sure that you don't squint, um, avoiding wrinkles, right? It's a form of botulism. That's kind of interesting. So Botox and botulism actually block. They're an antagonist to acetylcholine. Think of the role of acetylcholine. What does it do? Look back in your notes. How does it make sense that Botox would block its ability to do its job? Well, acetylcholine allows for muscle contractions. It allows you to squint and to like hold your pen because that takes muscles. And it allows you to like move your mouth because that takes muscles, right? And if it blocks acetylcholine, you can't use those muscles. Makes sense, right? All right, guys, we've talked about all things of the neuron. In the next set of the notes, we're going to talk about the bigger systems involved with the nervous and endocrine systems. So I will see you there.